Uh, I, I must be forgetting something. What'd she leave out? The Endless Forest. Oh, Endless Forest. Okay, I knew I, knew I couldn't do them all because, in fact, you two have been very prolific. Yeah. We've been kind of crazy. Um, we uh, started way back in making video games anyway, 10 years ago. I'm going to try to find an image of the Endless Forest because I know I have one, a good one. Here's a whole bunch of slides of that um, that are worth seeing. Let's see. Oh, wait, no, not that. Not that one. It's this one. The, we started out by making The Endless Forest. That was our first game that we released. You can't see it. <laughs> Um, but um, we the can endless, describe it. Yeah, the endless forest is a multiplayer game where everybody plays a deer. Anyway, we <laughs> wanted to. When Michael and I decided we wanted to make video games, we're based here in Belgium, huh? so we're in Ghent, which is about a half hour away from here. If you don't know Belgium, um, and there was no such thing as an independent games scene at all here. It was all. This was in 2000 and. and two that we first decided to do this and um, back then you kind of had to make video games like in a very commercial way so it was about us finding a publisher and putting discs in boxes and selling them in stores and we couldn't do that obviously that was just really impossible so I'll just tell a little bit of a, the story behind this the endless forest happened because our first game was the game we couldn't make our first game um, was a game called eight um, where we didn't even know how to make video games, and we learned. Um, we taught ourselves but, you know, on, with stuff from the internet by talking to other developers um, and asking them how they make video games, stuff like that. But then ultimately we needed money, and so what we did is we went to the Vlaams Audiovisual Funds, which is the Flemish Audiovisual Fund, which is the fund in Belgium which funds uh, film, basically film and television, media, stuff like that. And at that time, they were like, we were like, hey, will you, will you fund a game? And, right, they, right. and they said, no. They were like, no, it's against our mandate. Absolutely not. So, so we, at that yeah. time, uh, would you say the understanding of the film and art world, their, their literacy with video games may have been low? It was non-existent. Non-existent. <laughs> see, also, you have to understand it's a special situation here in Belgium. I mean, Belgium is not Holland. Eh? Right. Belgium is like 10 years behind on everything, like pretty much consistently, and you laugh, <laughs> but you know it's true. You know it's true. <laughs> So we're going to have a candid, honest, open no, conversation. No, you know it's true. I mean, if you, if you live here, you kind of know it's true. It's like, so it was sort of like we had to go there with our computers. We took everything down there, and we like explained to them exactly what we were doing making video games, that it wasn't just a commercial enterprise, that we had an interest in the cultural aspect of it, and that this would enrich the culture of the country. Before and we move stuff. ahead, can we talk <laughs> about the sort of unique way in which you and Michael as creators uh, came at video games? Because yeah. you didn't necessarily have the traditional, oh, I grew up up on Mario and now I want to make a platformer background. You had been doing digital art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, okay, yeah. So that bears worth, that's worth saying too because we were doing digital art but we were doing it on the internet. So it was not about being in a country and needing funding or anything. It was just, you know, we were basically designers. We were web designers, although I have a background in sculpture and mm -hmm. Michael has a background more in, uh, in uh, graphic design. We were making digital art on the internet and it was sort of a self-funding thing. I, mean, I feel like peop a lot of people here might be young enough that they might not remember, you know, they might not know necessarily what the landscape of first creating art digitally, interactive art on the internet was during the time that the internet um, was still young. I was yeah. I was quite young, and I think I'm older than than some people here. Um, in that, you know, some of my early explorations online was me discovering some of the interactive art communities that you may have belonged to decade before I would ever know yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it was like from that's sort of what we did from a very young. Age, Can you describe what it was like? Just being on the well, what it was like. I mean, okay, so the internet of 1995. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Well, it was really cool. <laughs> what can I say? No, um, it was. Uh, it was sort of the a formative thing because, um, speaking for myself, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't really even into computers until the internet. I, I mean, I, shortly before that, I sort of rediscovered computers yeah. um, and wanted to make things with them. But then the internet sort of inspired me even more to want to do things, to learn how to code, to um, communicate with people online all over the world, to learn how that worked, and then ultimately to to make artwork with computers. So that's pretty much 
and to have clients. I mean, basically the internet was everything. Everything was internet. It was like, you could work there, you could play there, you could you know, make your artwork there, everything. And it was, and I guess it's sort of like now, only it was much, much smaller, more condensed, and more alive to a certain extent, not to badmouth the internet. Well, now, I think what you mean by alive is that I feel like in those early days when there were, you know, the original internet pioneers and the original creatives trying to make use of this new and very private space, mm -hmm. it was almost, it was the way that we view design possibility space in general and that it was constrained, there were certain limitations, but there were certain desirabilities like connecting with others yeah. or like creating experiences that couldn't exist in any other medium. So even though yeah. beginning your work in net art is sort of, you know, it's different from games, I think in actually, you know, if you look at it from, with, through the lens of history, that a lot of that work was still the same in that you had a, a specific set of goals and were inventing something that kind of, you know, people didn't have a broad literacy with yet. Yeah, I guess so, but we didn't care if a lot of people had a broad literacy with it at the time. Unlike with games where you're really trying to, like, reach a lot of people with what you're doing and you're trying to please them to a certain extent. Right. I would say that the early net was more about uh, the pure uh, experiment, the pure uh, being a pioneer of something because it was something that didn't exist at all. Yeah. And then it suddenly did, and then what do you do with it? Right. And so it was all about that. And in a way, that's what drew me to the indie scene and games, right. was that it felt similar, um, or feels similar even now. I can still see some aspects of that, even though it's more mature. It's, there's definitely been a lot that's changed since 2002 with what's going on in games. But there's still that um, sense of pioneership. There's still that sense of pioneership, and I think that's something that everyone who comes to an event like this uh, definitely can feel, or everybody who goes to any of these things and meets other people who are passionate about what they're doing, you can still sort of feel that um, underneath yeah. it all, you know? I agree. And um, and I think I've just have, I'm addicted to being in that situation, being between things, you know? It's like, uh, and between art and and, um, science or whatever you want to call it and uh, yeah so t the you originally had a concept for a game called eight yeah what's the significance of the number eight is it personal or can we share it um, no 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 it's not personal at all it was uh, a game eight was a game about uh, sleeping beauty it was based on the fairy tale of sleeping beauty yeah and um, the deal was we wanted to call it eight because we're sitting here in Belgium nobody speaks English well more people speak English now, but I gotta say, in the beginning of... You had moved from New York. Yeah, I had moved to New York in, in 1999, I moved here. And um, it was sort of about being more, op wanting to be more open and, and diverse. So the game was such that we didn't even want to have words in it. We wanted everybody to be able to play it and not have to have a burden of learning English, so to speak, in order to play our game. So, and we also couldn't afford to translate it into a bunch of languages. That was also, so we knew these limitations, so we called it eight, which is a number. And then it's just, that is the name of it, is whatever it was in your language. And right. So, and then the game itself had no, had no words in it at all. It was all atmosphere, it was all about uh, a world that you walked around in. I mean, now it sounds like, yeah, okay, you know, a world you walk around in and you discover things. But at the time, this was really, really odd, and that's why we couldn't find, it didn't fit into a genre. It wasn't, at the time, an adventure game was something very, very specific, an adventure game. Which required point. objects, objectives, yeah. interacting one thing and another. But moreover, goals. even worse, it was a point and click 3D rendered flat. Yeah. So it's like you have 3D rendered. It was not full explorable 3D. There were like a two full on explorable 3D At games. At the end of the 90s, people were like doing like FMV and high, yeah. like they were trying to showcase the powers that computers had. And if you're trying to make something that's sort of more focused on interaction that is soft and that is human, you know, it's, I, I imagine that you would have had a hard time explaining to potential funding partners what yeah. it was you were trying to make. Well, yeah, and that was really, the problem was that at, at the, in the early 2000s, things had sort of regressed in the triple a market to the point where it felt like unless you had lots and lots and lots of money you couldn't make anything weird and then and then you still couldn't make anything weird yeah. you know it's like so it was like whereas I felt that indeed before that that wasn't a problem like, right there were lots of things like CD-ROMs that were had very strange themes and um, you, that that were more about interaction. I played you know, so that, many then, strange then, projects like that myself yeah. on hypercard stacks, on, yeah, on shareware exactly. discs, and exactly. they were just the work of artists halfway across the world without necessarily an objective, just yeah. with strange, you know, mysterious interactions and and uh, you know, unstated goals. And you, I always. One of the reasons that I always that I became attracted to your work as soon as I you know found out about it was that. That was something I enjoyed about games when I was a teenager, was this discovery space and the feeling that I was in a dialogue with someone that I'd never meet. Yeah. And I think that's part of the language of the early internet, this idea that you, know, you can use these interactive objects not to achieve a goal or to create a win condition, but to meet somebody. Yeah, 
That was, that was like this, the absolute goal of the internet in the beginning was just to meet other people <laughs> who were also doing the same thing. And so you, how did you meet them? You met them through your work, yeah. you know? And, in, and again, this is sort of a parallel with what I feel about the indie game scene in, like right now, um, such as it is. And I, I feel weird even using that phrase, indie game scene. It's more like there's scenes, yeah. you know, it's, there's a multiplicity of things going on right now incredibly that are incredibly space. interesting. Um, well, some more interesting than others, but I think that the fact that it's always a moving target is um, what's cool about it right now. So, uh, so eight was maybe a bit ambitious and hard to explain to people. So that brought you to yeah, this concept of the end make, endless forest. The endless forest, which was something that we didn't even need at first funding to make. We just made the first version of it pretty much on our own. And then what we did was we um, we went back and we asked for funding again from Vaf, and they gave us a little bit. And then we exhibited it in uh, um, festivals here in in Flanders, like um, the Artifact Festival, which happens in Leuven. Um, and so they had a small budget, so they gave us some money, and then we added to the game. So it was sort of like that. So the things that are in the game now are almost sort of a, a collage of the different opportunities that we had over time to make, to add something to this game and to exhibit it. Um, um, Were there other games ways. like this on the festival circuit when you started making it? Um, no, but... Was there a festival circuit? There me? was indeed, but it was very different. Um, and I was pointing this out to somebody else, that um, for a while there was no distinction um, between there were there's a lot of festivals in Europe. There's like you know Ars Electronica and, and that other one that's in Germany, uh, uh, Transmediale is what I'm thinking of, and and various other opportunities that happened. But and a lot of artists were working with video games actually. But what they were doing was they were modding Quake or something, yeah. or they were making a Half Life mod, or they were a Counter Strike mod. That was like a really it's big one. Subverting existing Strike, designs. Subverting the games. And, and those were actually what people knew about art, artists working with games. Huh. And, and that was something that we actually were against, because <laughs> we, we were sort of like, well, if you're going to make art with games, let's like, get in the code, let's make, make it ourselves, you know, instead of just modding something, which doesn't negate the value of those mods. Because it's, it's just your of, heritage that you had been accustomed yeah. to invention rather than modification. Yeah, yeah. It's, most of what you saw was intervention. Um, and. So we were inspired to make games in that way as well, sort of a, a being like, well, why as an artist do you have to mod an existing commercial product? Why, why as an artist you? am I not a deer? <laughs> why as an artist am I not a deer? Yeah, well, the deer. That's a whole story. Yeah, so talk, about. talk about, can you take us to the conception of this game? Yeah, um, we and were on a train and we were driving through Germany. Was it Germany? The, the dark forest, the black forest or something? Oh, the Ardennes, okay, we're not so poetic as the black forest. But through the Ardennes, and um, we looked around and we sort of said half-jokingly, wouldn't it be funny to make a game that took place in a forest? And we were like, ha, 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 yeah. And everybody plays a deer, ha, 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 and the deer are all asleep, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, then, and then it sort of grew from that, honestly. Because we thought, we thought it was beautiful in the first conception of it, because we first conceived it as a, as a screensaver, where yeah, okay, so it's like your computer goes to sleep and then the game starts up as a screensaver and then everyone wakes up as a deer in the forest and it's like a dream or something. I remember a lot of um, <laughs> so. interactive animal-oriented experiences at the end of the 90s in the yeah. digital art space online. So I, can, I, sort of knowing that heritage of yours, can sort of see where that idea might have come from. Yeah. Um, that the more we could do with graphics, the more people were creating these beautiful and inhabited animated spaces that had living things in it. Yeah. And the more we were able to sort of you know, we were all really excited about this technology and toward the end of the 90s, I think we were starting to conceive of what, what if we could create real space within these worlds. Yeah, and I think that the internet also gave us that feeling. Um, it, it's hard to describe and I'll try to because uh, the internet actually felt like um, you were someplace else. And so when I started playing video games, a lot of the first games that Michael and I were playing regularly were things like black and white, right? The first black and white. Yeah. And, and it, if you play, ever played that game, I suggest you all do, because it's really cool. But it's like, you can lose like days in this game, because it's really long. But also because the world is so um, atmospheric and immersive, and you really feel like you are the hand. It's a god game. So it's like, it's a god game, and you have an animal that's with you that you're sort of raising up. And, and there's always this feeling of camar camaraderie with this animal, which is run by an AI. So we were super interested in AI in the beginning. And, th and that showed also in our first design for eight. Yeah. Um, and, but th also that atmosphere that we felt in games like that. Um, 
where we felt like, wow, it's a whole world that's living around you, and it reminded me of being on the internet, and there's this whole world. And it's, it's a hard parallel to draw now, but it, because now the internet doesn't really feel like a place, because there's all these real people there. Yeah, but it's back a thing in the day, you do now. Back in the day, you knew nobody's name. You only knew their handle. You knew where their website, their web address, or whatever. Do you whatever. remember any of your favorite old internet handles that you'd be willing to share? Because I, I, <laughs> I have some, yeah. <laughs> Mine? Yeah. Oh, I was always, I only ever had one, and that was Woman on Fire. <laughs> yeah. But that was, <laughs> that's my only That's still your handle. Skype idea. That's still my Skype ID. Yeah, and um, well, then mine was Chibi Girl One. <laughs> it was all it was all Sailor Moon references and things like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, yeah. I never told anyone my real name, and uh, if I did, I told them it was like Neherenia or something. Yeah, yeah. You never really had a real reason to tell anyone your name. I mean, so or or to be your real self even. Yeah. So it was a lot more of like. Um, Do you think a game like about vital space, like the Endless Forest, is sort of addresses that fundamental loneliness in a poetic way? Maybe I'm wow, being too game criticky about it. But. I think it does because a lot of people who play it, um, who play the Endless Forest, who want to be a deer in a forest where you're casting magic on each other. I'd love that. Um, <laughs> are, um, are, who wants to be a deer and cast? magic everybody <laughs> thank you they're all really sweet I mean the community <laughs> around the game which is still alive today and in fact it's like kind of our most popular game I mean <laughs> basically because it's free and it's always been free and the reason it's always been free is because we kind of made it with public funds and we were just like well why should we charge for this why should we fix it so we can sell like you know you were creating something that was an artwork and not a commercial product yeah well even more than that it felt more like we wanted this to be a place when we first conceived of it we wanted it, we just wanted a place that was always online, that we could always go to, and it didn't matter if we were there or not. If we are there, we could do all kinds of special things and change the world and make it rain and make flowers grow and thunder and planes and all this other stuff, but if we're not there, it's still there and it's still a beautiful space and we can change the environment for people. People write us and they're like, oh, can it be sort of like... Um, it's my anniversary, can you make it snow? Yeah, can you make it snow? Or like when, when some, one of the players died, we had a memorial where we oh. hung a star in the sky and that like everybody so went beautiful. and sat around it in a circle and like, I mean, it was just like all these things. So in a way, yes, fundamental loneliness, I guess, but more about... The game is more about joy because you kind of can't play it without laughing and, and yeah. feeling like an idiot, and, and that's great. I mean, we think that there needs to be a place for that as well, and um, we're pretty proud of the game even now. I mean, I still kind of love it and would love to work on it all as the time. As you should, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But so yeah. after this, uh, you created something you felt proud of and that you felt good about and that people responded yeah. to and that you were able to get public funds for well, a pretty good first that, game. We were able to prove that what we were doing was something that people wanted to play with, yeah. which was um, a big challenge um, because the problem with 8 was that everybody was like, well, I don't know how to market that. Yeah. You know, I don't know how to market that. I don't know how to tell people about that. And we kept telling them how they could tell people about that. But <laughs> it was like not up to us. I think but you in were this a case, bit ahead of your time in terms of your goals in your language. I think back yeah. then, um, games as a product were very much tied to the hardware market. And yeah. generally, publishers wanted to know how will your game showcase the hardware? You know, how will yeah. your game sell units? Yeah, it was also a problem with, with the fact that, OK, and this takes us to sort of the next step of this whole thing where the internet comes in again. To me, independent games are sort of the art form that's born on the internet, mm. um, because without the internet, we wouldn't have had all this whole indie revolution or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, because I people be had to learn to use their credit cards online. I remember in 2002, to ask someone to pay for something online with their credit card was like, oh, you're going to steal my number. Dancing with the devil. Gonna, yeah, exactly. It I mean, just, you didn't even meet people online back then, really. Yeah, it just wasn't even... Yeah, internet. Oh, you mean that place where they have porn? You yeah. Know, that was the internet to a lot of people still. It in still is to some people. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I mean, okay. it's only within yeah. the last five years it's become acceptable Except to like, find a partner online or to, oh, yeah. you know, like it's, it's recently exploded, but I think we can easily underestimate just how different things were as recently as 12 years ago. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so the fact that people learn to love each other online. I mean, I met my husband online. Um, that's where we met in, in 1999 was on a server called Hell. But at any rate, um, <laughs> this the idea that people would actually buy things online, not only that, buy data, not buy something physical. Um, we needed all that to happen before games could sort of open up and become um, 
a place where you know you or you or anyone can actually make something, find people who want to play it, and um, and actually like let them have it and get, find out what they think about it and all that sort of stuff. Get so, it made now. Developing in public made. is the norm. Getting funding in public is the norm, and yeah. the creator is engaged in a one-to-one -one relationship with the player base from the time that they conceive of an idea if they'd like it to be the yeah, case. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So after the Endless Forest, what came next for you? What did we do after that? <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we got seven games, so it all got kind of complicated at a certain point. I mean, and, and every time it's, um, oh, I guess we made the graveyard. We started working on the path first, probably, but then we decided to make the graveyard. Um, as an interim project. As an interim project. This is going to play, and I, I don't think I have the sound on, so that's good. Um, there. Um, those of you who don't know the graveyard, it's just it's a game where you play a little old lady who visits a cemetery, and um, you just walk through the it's you walk through the cemetery, you sit on a bench, a song plays, and you she may or may not die. Um, she may not. She may not. It's I thought random. She, well, I, it's that's never happened random. to me before. She's always died for you. I, I thought it was. Just I can't a, even play the version where she dies. Tragic it's too traumatic. destiny. Yeah, it's too traumatic. It's a 50-50 chance, and you're just unlucky. But, so what year was this just about? This was 2008, I guess. So this was when most of us were playing really strong running men on our consoles, not little walking um, <laughs> elderly women. But this was an experiment, because this was actually the first game we really, we, we sold it all. And, and, and even selling it was sort of like, well, you know, it, we didn't expect anyone to really buy it or anything. And we ended up like sort of making a bit of a tempest in a teapot type com controversy controversy with it. But you were which making a statement with this game, I think. Yeah, and it led to various, like, you know, parody games, like the one made by Vlambert. Uh, what did they make? <laughs> they made a game called The Gutter, or JW did, made a game called The Gutter or something. No, where tell it's like, me. You play a drunk who is stumbling down the street, and I forget <laughs> what happens. He gets hit by a car is or something. Is that a parody or a tribute? No, I, I never figured <laughs> out, because the cool thing was he emailed it to us with, a, with sort of a funny email, and we just sort of laughed like really hard, played it, and like, <laughs> it was cool. Anyway, yeah, so we, but, but we did, were flattered in a funny way. Were you trying with yeah. this experiment to make some sort of provocation about the nature of traditional games? Because I think a lot of people of attributed prov provocation to you at the time. And I think that was the deal, was like we were trying to be provocative, but that was because we were frustrated as hell, like because what? it was, it seemed like everything was always the same, and we were sort of sick of everything being the same. So we're like, we'll make something complete. I mean, The Endless Forest wasn't different enough for these people. We figured, okay, well, we'll try this. You know? These people. These people. No, you don't understand. It was like a real. It was a real freaking struggle for a long time. And, I remember. Um, I think that was when I first became acquainted with you, and I was a little frightened of you, um, because I oh, figured good. that you would be standing in the corner wielding dark capes and and thinking Something that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We kind of were for a while. A little until bit until after the path. Until after the path, then we kind of understood. Well, um, what was it that you? I mean, I. Uh, I think it was amazing that you were sort of abrading the grain of popular culture in that way, even if people couldn't fully embrace or appreciate what you were trying to say necessarily at that time. Um, but what is it that changed in your perception between the graveyard and the path that made you more amenable to the idea of popular video games? Well, let's see. Let me back that up a bit. It's <laughs> like we liked a lot of popular video games. I mean, we started wanting to make video games because we were playing Devil May Cry and oh, Silent Hill. I love Devil May Cry and, and Silent Hill. Fatal Frame and Eco and I don't even know what else. Um, we were playing all these games that we thought were fabulous, actually. And But the problem was that we only liked certain aspects of them. Or rather, we felt that they fell apart at certain parts. Like, you know, if I talk about a game like uh, like Silent Hill or whatever, Very clumsy which to it's play. hard for me to say anything bad about, actually, because I loved that game so much. Silent Hill 1 and 2 and 3. I think as complete works. 4 is where I amazing. broke up with them. But <laughs> it's just that it was something like... Or any, you could take any game at the time. There were so many beautiful ideas and so many people with so many like interesting interaction design or um, aesthetics or whatever, but then it sort of fell short um, when it came to mechanics, sort of being, okay, we, we just had all these questions, like why is it always an RPG? Why is an RPG always like this thing with the random spawn battle? And uh, you could sort of map out all these things that were always the same. Yeah. And we just wanted to call that into question big time because we were kind of sick of it. Like, um, not only as players even. I mean, just sort of like, well, okay, so this is a platform game. Okay, so we know it's gonna have this and it's gonna have that and it's gonna do that. You know, and it was just sort of boring. Yeah. And I think it also happens that um, 
we thought that there wasn't enough diversity in the types of characters you could play, in the types of worlds you could explore, the sorts of stories that were available, and we thought we saw an opportunity. So it's not like sure. we were against things. It was more that we saw lots of opportunity in there, lots of unexplored territory in there, and we wanted. We're wondering why not more more companies. At the time, we were thinking of companies. In 2008, you had a very strong indie scene, so we were more encouraging. I mean, it didn't seem like it at the time. We seemed very combative, I imagine, in 2008, well, 2009. Well, I definitely re but I read your frustration at, at, at a failure to take advantage of opportunity. Um, I think people may have misread it as a condemnation of what uh, existed versus a desire for alternative. It was, in a way, a condemnation because otherwise... I'm trying to stand up for you. No, I know, no, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. But I just wanted to say that the reason why we didn't mind that so much at the time was that... Um, otherwise, no one would listen to you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's still <laughs> it's the case like... that you have to say something sort of outrageous and confrontational yeah. to get attention, especially now on Twitter. Yeah. It's, but it was, I feel like it was worse before. So you were starting <laughs> Twitter fights before there was Twitter. Before there was Twitter. We had a blog. <laughs> you know, that's what you do with blogs, right? So no, it was, and, but, it would, but then more than that, we found, support, we found supporters and we found like-minded people, people who also were trying to think of other things, people who were trying to make... All kinds of games. I mean, and it was and it was interesting to be a part of uh, supporting their thoughts, yeah, um, and their ambitions. In 2008, and for the first time, you're able to connect with other people that look like indie developers to you. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it. And and so, uh, I'd say that it wasn't until after the path, though, that we really felt like that things changed for us and for everyone. I suppose. Before we move ahead, I also yeah. want to talk about the path a bunch because, um, you know, the games that you mentioned, Silent Hill, Fatal Frame, Devil May Cry, um, I think all those games have something in common with your games, which is a really strong sense of atmosphere. They're very evocative in terms of place, um, sound design and things like that. When I, whenever I enter a world that, that you two have made, I feel that really strong sense of, of sentiment in the atmosphere, which I think, um, you know, you share in common with those you know, AAA games that you said that you liked. And, um, you know, so while a lot of people may find that sort of conventional vocabulary and that sameness of knowing what to expect from game mechanics to be comfortable, I think this is a theory, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think maybe I would guess that what you tried to do with the path is to carry that horror atmosphere, that faint commingling of pathos and distaste and, and, and romance, and try to bring it into an environment where you were inventing a new... Uh, mechanical vocabulary, where you're trying to do something other than what was familiar in terms of the mechanics. See, all this is complicated by the <laughs> fact that that a lot of what we were trying to do yeah, was to just do what we wanted to do. And that felt like Fair a enough. struggle often. Like Let maybe, go to interact. Yeah, let go to interact. I can <laughs> Crossed out pictures of the yeah, controls. Yeah. Um, this is another bad slide, but... I can bring it up to the like go to interact part where it was like we were just like always wondering why like the aesthetics of interaction weren't brought in more. Um, well, to for people the... who aren't familiar with the game at all, yeah. in case they're not, do you want to talk about the central premise and then talk yeah. about how you tried to build the interaction? With there was them like that? a couple of really um, sort of pseudo controversial things we were doing with the path. Um, several. Um, one of which was it was a game that that had nothing but female protagonists, and there were six of them. So it's like six teenage girls, uh, girls ranging in age from nine to nineteen, and that was number one. Like. What the hell? And then number two was that it's based on a fairy tale, Little Red Riding Hood, but at the same time, it's not doing the typical sort of BS thing where you, you give Red Riding Hood an, a, an axe and she chases after the wolf or something Shocked stupid and screwed like that. fairy tales. Yeah, Starring dark fairy American tales. McGee. But at the same time, we always knew that this game was going to be a horror story because it is a horror story. I mean, it's a fairy that it, that is what it is at its root. And... So, but we, at the same time, what we were trying to do was tell us a, a, um, a story about femaleness, if you want to call it that. And I wouldn't even say that's what we were trying to do. It's just that's what it was. Unconsciously, you know? that came through for because, you. Because, well, hey, I'm a girl, and these are girls, and you can. And I really strongly believe you can only make artworks out of your own experience, even though you might be like making something about something you know very little about. It's, you're still gonna filter yourself through it. So it's like, even though it's about females, about girls, I mean, Michael wrote all the, the dialogue, you know? It's like everybody just assumes I did the writing, and well, I'm just like, no, Well, you were your partners in, in many things. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and also the interaction design, we felt like had to express, I mean, to get back to what you were bringing up, had to express this, um, this 
your concept of, of yeah. womanhood and your concept. Yeah, so we were like, well, why are we trying to control the avatar here? You know, it's like, so the way you play the game is when you see something interesting, you have to let her go and, do, and see what she does. You have to let her go and let her do what she's going to do. And you sometimes may not want her to do that. And we felt like that relationship to the avatar at that moment is kind of what it's like. You know, it's like, it's like maybe at that moment you're more like the mother who sent the girl to her grandmother's house. And you're like, no, no, don't do that. Go back to the path, you know. But she's not going to. She's going to explode. It just ended up being this big, giant metaphor for a whole bunch of stuff wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a <laughs> horror story. And then also the way that the girls um, meet their wolves and all the stuff was very kind of violent and shocking to a lot of people at the time. We Each took girl a lot has of a narrative arc on her yeah. way to the grandmother's house and yeah. has a different fate befall her, yeah. ideally. And, and we took tons and tons and tons of boatloads of heat for that, um, for the ways that the stories end, even though now you kind of look at it and you're like, why was everybody getting so excited no, about I don't, this? I actually, I don't remember <laughs> this. Um, yeah, you don't well, have to dwell on it too much, no. but, but to, what sort of controversy did it have? Oh, well, it was just that I think a lot of people... Um, thought that, um, didn't understand what we were trying to say. Yeah. And we, the point of that is that we weren't trying to say anything. So people had their various <laughs> interpretations. Which they of, then projected which onto Which they didn't you. project it onto us and the game. And we're warning people like, oh my God, this game, don't let your daughters play this game. You know, <laughs> it's subversive. It's made by a bunch of sexists. It's made by, you know, it's like, even though it's for a woman team. Does that happen game. in other, <laughs> you know, given that you've worked in other art that is all, obviously always going to be subjective and open to interpretation. Yeah. Had that happened to you before where something you created was received by someone in a way that was their interpretation that they then blamed you for? Is that only a thing that happens in games? <laughs> well, I think it happens in other medium, in other ways, you know, I think that happens all the time in the arts, absolutely, and that's the point. However, in games, you're dealing, we were dealing with an audience in 2009, how can I put it delicately, that t kind of wasn't used to be having that opportunity, I'll yeah. put it positively. Yeah. Wasn't used to having that opportunity for interpretation and was used to being told what to do all the time. Yeah, and there was... And so since we weren't telling them what to do, they suddenly, their imagination's running wild and, and then they suddenly think that we were telling them something that we weren't saying at all. Right. So yeah, that's the only way I can think of explaining that. I so feel like yeah, gamers even now are not used to coping without clear objectives. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. I think a lot of the reasons people play is because they want to know what they're supposed to do, because it's a space where they can receive and follow instructions. It's the magic circle. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so you had some challenging reception for this, but you also had some immensely positive fan reception with people okay. doing art and cosplay and, yeah. and, and people really, uh, this world that you made with, with all of these young women and their interestingly subtly gothic outfits and things oh, yeah. like that resonated subtly deeply. Subtly and not so subtly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it did resident, resonate deeply with a lot of people and we had, I had to concentrate on the, the sort of positive bits of it and, and not let the negative get me down too well, too much, which was hard. Um, and, um, but I think that a lot of creators have to deal with that, like, well, at least now that, that the indies are making things, like, you know, you know you're going to find your audience, and then you have to deal with the haters, and, and that's all just part of the experience, you know. And, and so I had to learn that. Well, it, I, <laughs> I mean, paid my dues. It's an oh, interesting lesson <laughs> for someone who's always done art online, uh, um, but never maybe in this exposed way and never in this direct communication with everyone who experiences yeah, well, it. Well, the funny part is we did, like all the stuff we made online, it's just that the game scene was very, very different, yeah. is all I gotta say, than, than any other form of ma art making that I had ever experienced. And so it took a little getting used to. Um, and I didn't, I don't even, we, 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 we steadfastly said that we weren't artists for the longest time because we were just like, not, not with games, but when we were just making stuff with computers because we felt like it's not about this art thing. Like, what is that? That's <laughs> the stuff you see in galleries is boring, this white box, black box stuff. This is stuff that's on your computer. Everyone can download this. Everyone can play it. Um, anyone can make it even, you know, even though that's something that people forget now, that yeah. you can just make this stuff, you and know. And games are now sort of going through that whole evaluation of identity too, after going through these questions of asking what's art, or games art, what does art mean, yeah. and now they're just like, I want to be able to make these things and share them with others, which yeah. is basically as far as anyone should think about anything we make, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but now we're back to just sort of thinking about it more as an art form, because we feel like we kind of have to come up for this idea that that games do something that other media don't. Yes. And we want people to realize that that's worth a lot culturally. Um, and that's the fight that we had in the beginning here in Belgium, finding uh, some sort of arts funding. And um, now that we're sort of 
um, only partially arts funded. There's a game fund, and that's sort of ruining everything. Oh no! Let me repeat: it's ruining everything. Um, <laughs> and um, because, and we, I guess this is a whole other conversation. But yeah, it's um, there's that we feel like that there has to be a space where um, this medium can be free, and and that shouldn't be strictly um, tied to commercial considerations. Because it's a cultural act, making a video game and having someone play it is a cultural act, and it's an important thing because um, people do this, and more people pay attention to video games than probably go to art galleries. I Absolutely. Mean, um, I definitely do. Maybe not the big museums, <laughs> but like going to a, like just an art gallery. I mean, whatever. Anyway, it's, it's a popular art form. It's, it's interesting, and, and that, that, that's worth um, sticking up for. So we, we sort of insist on this uh, idea of a tie to other cultural activities right now. So as we move on, what, what was something important that you learned from the path that you then planned to carry into your next project? I'd say the idea of the way that we learned to collaborate with people on the path was something that we definitely carried over into what was the next game, Fatal. Um, Fatal. Yeah. Um, although with Fatal, we were even more insistent on it being um, sort of a personal exploration because we had made the path and that took three years, which was deathly long. Never make a project that lasts that long. Um, and um, we sort of felt like if we didn't make something else soon, we were going to die. So we, we just immediately launched into Fatal, but we were like, we you felt kind of... You were going to die commercially or emotionally? Emotionally. <laughs> like, well, emotionally and like, and just after you finish a big project, I don't know if how many of you have made like a big game, but like you feel have this feeling of emptiness afterwards that you feel like... Um, Oh, I just spent like 16 hours a day every day for the past three years working on this, and now what do I do with myself? And <laughs> so it felt like we need to make something else and make it quick, or else. Um, so we we spent like four months or whatever on Fatal. I don't even know if this video works, but I'll try it. Um, um, but and to us, it was kind of an important project, but to everyone else, they couldn't they couldn't care less, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Cause was I it still that they didn't care or that it was hard for them to parse? I think it was hard to parse, and um, we didn't know it would be hard to parse, and I mean, there's uh, mistakes were made. We're happy with that, though. I well, mean... I, I do maybe, uh, let me present a theoretical that, you know, the things that frustrated you about traditional games because they were the same, um, is it possible that you might not have been able to notice the ways that those familiar structures were useful and reinforcing yeah. and communicated? Well yeah, with in a way, it was that. Um, we also, yeah, we're feeling a little selfish, and we just really wanted to make what we wanted to make at that moment, you know. This is but admirable. yeah, the communication. I think that you're right, and we learned to value that a lot more after Fatal. Um, and going forward, even though we still made games that were hard to parse, we kind of knew what we were doing more. I mean, I think with, with The Path, there's a lot of things in it that are sort of commenting still on existing game structures. Like, there's sure. in, in, in The Path, there's 144 flowers scattered throughout the forest, and you can find them all. But if you did it, do that, then nothing happens. It's like, well, you just gathered 144 flowers. Do you feel good, good you. about having attained yeah. that number? <laughs> yeah, and it was sort of a comment about like things like Grand Theft Auto, where there's like hidden packages everywhere, you know? And, I always found and, the hidden packages. Yeah. I feel really ashamed of myself. So it's like things like that that we just put in because we thought it was kind of funny or we thought it was kind of... I don't know, interesting or whatever for certain thought people who would get it. Thought exercises that you were implementing. Yeah, and so I think Fatal, we just took the thought exercises that one step further and, <laughs> um, and lost to everybody. Well, but, but, but you and Michael were used to creating within a language that was primarily understood by the two of you. Yeah, kind of. I wouldn't, yeah. As, as, I mean, yes. as, as creators, you're, you're very close <laughs> as a pair, and it yeah. can be hard. I mean, and I think that's a lesson that can apply to any game developer, that if you work closely with the same group of people, and if you work within your local scene or with, with your close friend, you may, over time, fail to notice the way that your inside language may not easily be conveyed to other people. Yeah. Um, and you... That, that may not be, it may not be necessary that other people understand what you're trying to do. Um, in, in your case, you made the game that you wanted to make, and it, and it didn't bother you so much no. that, that people weren't able to sort of join you in the Fatal experience uh, to the extent that you yeah. Yeah. thought that they might. But, you know, it's, it, I think anybody, no matter where they're coming from with their approach to games, can, can sort of benefit occasionally from, the, from, from looking outside the ways that they're used to thinking and yeah. speaking. Um, and so you began to do that from this project onward. Yeah. I think that... Fatal tied more into um, sort of secret thoughts that we had um, about like art and its connection to video games. But then we went and we made Vanitas after that, I think. And then 
um, after Vanitas came Bientôt l'été. Vanitas was, was mobile, Vanitas right? Was, Vanitas was a mobile game, but it was sort of a commission. And, um, and it's a small game. You can download it to your phone. It's and, uh, Android also, um, and iPhone. And, um, but it was, it was kind of fun. Um, you, but used, you used the mobile and the touch medium to explore object relationships yeah. And, yeah. and preciousness of things. And it sort of defined like, how we like to work with um, touch de touchscreen devices, which carried over into Luxurious Superbia, which is over there. Um, I, the I would screen. argue Luxurious and Superbia is your first gamey game. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's that's there's, that's on purpose. We could actually talk about that a little bit before we'll get, we we'll run get out to of that, time. But I don't want to skip you until I'm, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. Oh, how, how much time do we have? Um, and uh, yeah, I would rather like if people had questions or something, sure, talk sure. To them about that. But um, Bientôt l'été was after that, which is um, a game in French for two. The being French um, simulator. The being French simulator <laughs> or whatever. Um, a lot of smoking, sighing, sipping wine and romantic but, phrasing. But, but, but no, it, it's about <laughs> romance more than anything else. I mean, it's about uh, the romance of meeting someone. And, and in a way, it was a parallel to how we met in a virtual space. So it's like a, a, a game that takes place in a, in a space, in space, in a simulator uh, of a beach. And then you find things on the beach and then you go and play a mysterious game of chess in a cafe, exchanging words that you had found on the beach, which is sort of like thoughts and... I actually, I really, really liked this. Um, I, oh, cool. This might be my favorite of yours, I'm not sure, because Whoa, um, really? not only exciting. did I enjoy the atmosphere, um, I'm, I'm a big a seaside thing. person, yeah. but um, it had a multiplayer component where at, whereby if you entered the house to play chess with the ghost at the other side of the table, it could be inhabited by a real person. Okay, um, and uh, I, I found that really exciting because the first time that I walked into the house and realized there was another player on the other side of the chessboard, I was so nervous and I was so excited. And, you know, the game of chess that you play with them is not a real chess game. It's just you have pieces that are on the board, but you don't have a full chess set and they're not playing a yeah, chess set against you. You can get a full you. chess set if you keep going out and collecting uh, the visions that the sort of Fata Morgana things that happen on the beach. Um, but yeah, no, you, you seldom have all the pieces. And, and it's, it's like sort of putting ritual together. That, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, no, I'm getting ahead. game critic-y on no, you go again. Ahead, go ahead. Um, but for me, the ritual of, of playing this half this half thought chess game with the other player, it was like this exercise in futility. Like, I can't play and finish this game with you. I'm never gonna have the words to resolve this relationship. Yeah. And every time, all you could do once you had gotten to a dead end in the conversation was you could smoke a cigarette, you could sip your wine, you could go for another walk and try to find another piece. And I just, I found that really poignant. I think this was a really good use of game vocabulary. If you ask me. Well, I think we were learning how to do both, how to, um, I mean, you can also play music with each other and just sit and listen to oh, music, yeah, which is that. something I like to do. That's something that we always wanted to do back in the beginning of the internet when um, Michael and I were just, were sort of remotely having a relationship and we always wanted to play music together. We would try to like... Synchronize, synchronize your rhythms. Our, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So it was like for us to be able to like make something, a system where people could play music to each other was kind of, was sort of the height of romance for us. Um, but um, at any rate, uh, I think that we were learning a lot more about how to, I mean, it's also important that, I don't know, that it's based on um, literature, um, the, the novels of Marguerite Duras uh, that uh, Michael really loves a lot and we watched a lot of her films and it, we just wanted to have this uh, the same atmosphere that we wanted people to feel the same way that we felt when dealing with her subject matter. Yeah, it's a funny thing to say, but yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm related to that as well. I mean, I think anyone, anyone could who's had a relationship across distance or who hasn't been able to say the words they wanted to say. Um, because we're running short on time, why don't we yeah. talk about what you're doing now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so other than Luxurious Superbia is out, and I hope you all will take a moment to touch it's the here, screen. It's here, you can play it. Touch the screen, because um, they made a really lovely little... Um, table for Enjoy it. Enjoy a relationship totally with, with your device through sensual touch. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and luxurious superbia. Yeah, I've got all this stuff. That's no, not important. Um, it is too important. Here, what do I have? Uh, I'm hoping I have something. Oh yeah, I have something that I can play in the background. Um, the, the, the deal with uh, that is that we were kind of happy with the way that this game came out. It came from uh, a completely different attitude of how we wanted to make video games. Um, where we're really consciously more so than we ever have in the past, thinking about um, the player of the game and trying to 
have a certain type of dialogue with them through its design. I mean, I think, I forget who said it, but you know, every game is really a dialogue with the, between the player and the designer. Sure. And we sort of take that a lot more seriously now, I think, um, especially since what we're, we make is a lot more um, subtle. So we want, we want people to understand, people were thinking that, especially after Bien Tolete, that our games were too complicated and they difficult were, you know, and like, uh, oh my God. Obscure, hard to parse, artsy and all these right. things. Right, and so we didn't, put, they don't feel that way to us. And so we made Bien, um, Luxury Superbia as sort of a, to make, give people something easier um, that, I don't know how to express it. Well, but people yeah. can play it here, but I want, I, want you to, I want to use the last five minutes or whatever to yeah, talk about your current project. And projects. so our project Sunset, which is the game we're working on now, that should be out next year, um, is, an, is a step towards that in a very different way in that we're going back to our sort of fully 3D rendered uh, explorable environment roots and um, making a first person game, which we haven't really done before. Um, usually we have an avatar there, mm -hmm. um, and in this case it's a first person experience. Um, it sort of reminds of games like Gone Home, I guess, but at the same time it's, it's much a genre more... Companion. It's a genre companion, I suppose. Um, although it's in our way, we have a way of sort of doing that, those sorts of things um, wrong. Um, so, so it'll be different. Um, and also it's a story that unfolds as you play it. So it's like you have an effect on the game as you're playing it. And basically, to go over it really quickly, um, you play a cleaner in an apartment, in a penthouse apartment in South America in 1972. Very specific. And you've modeled the apartment <laughs> on a real sort of luxury yeah. bachelor pad the, from Playboy. Yeah, Isn't we found cool? a luxury bachelor it. pad in Playboy magazine, a 1970s Playboy magazine, and that is where you are. And that is the owner is a man named Gabriel Ortega, who uh, you suspect is a complete and total snob jerk. But, um, you may be part of the conservative mil militia yeah, force, which, and you may be a member of the, the resistance. The importance of this taking place in the 70s is that that was a very tumultuous time, and we can't be completely unserious, because that's just how we are. So we're sort of dealing with a backdrop of a lot of um, military coup um, thing, an environment where there's a lot of uh, class governmental war. class war and governmental upheaval. And, um, but at the same time, you, are not a, you feel like you're not a part of that, at least at first. Um, you feel like, okay, I'm in this country, you've, you're an immigrant in this country, um, and you uh, feel like this has nothing to do with you. Um, but as would you, you... Would you say that yeah. you are discovering your relationship to this conflict and to the owner of the home mm -hmm. as the conflict escalates around you? Absolutely. As, the, <laughs> as, the, as you come to know the person who lives in this apartment, as you um, discover the, the sort of the intricacies of the, um, the military coup that has happened and the fact that your brother is somehow involved because he was there before you were even, and, like, and you're just trying to figure out how to deal with all this stuff, you're... The, the, the experience that's got, the things that are happening out in the outside world sort of bleed into your personal relationships. And then suddenly you sort of find that you, the things that you are doing may be influencing even the, the outcome of, of, the, of the, the military conflict, but not in any direct way. It's well, really it's like you can express your relationship to this man and your relationship to this environment by your actions in the home that you're tasked with cleaning. Yeah, yeah, basically. And, and it's sort of like you have Sorry, a, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have, and I'm really bad at talking about it. You have a relationship with this guy and, and, and in, you know, friendship. You can sort of choose the direction that the relationship takes, actually. Um, this is what I meant by your actions sort of um, influence the story. And... Um, in a way, you're trying to make him see that there's another way to things. He's a, a man who is deeply involved with the cultural life of this town that he lived in. But after the military coup, he discovers everything has gone wrong, and he doesn't know what to do about it either. And so it's like you're, in a way, your relationship with him, as it escalates, um, you, is sort of evidenced by the escalation of the conflict or not. But on a day-to-day on -day basis, you're living the life of this small component in a greater conflict. This exactly. person who's not a combatant and uh, you're, you're living out each day in this space that isn't yours. And yeah. I, um, based on what I've, I, I know of the work so far, I think there's a really oppor interesting opportunity for intimacy and atmosphere there, which is really yeah, what, yeah. what you we, excel we at. We definitely hope so. I mean, we, we basically wanted to play to our strengths. I mean, like I said, starting with Biento Lete, we learned a lot more about um, how to get things across to people 
through the mechanics of the game in a way that isn't as alienating. I mean, I think that really came forward in Luxurious Superbia, yes. which was totally not an alienating game. Um, and so we're really it's a little hoping saucy. that the next one... It's a little, it's a little saucy. saucy. Some people get embarrassed, but, you know. Um, so I always feel weird when people are watching me play it. I like, I'm really know. intimately involved in it. And I'm, I take pride in how good I am at Luxurious Superbia. <laughs> and then I notice there's, like, a, a lot of people hanging over my shoulder watching. And I feel a little, <laughs> feel a little uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah, well, we think with Sunset it won't be quite that... It's much more of an intimate experience, I think, because of the first-person view. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think that because you're influencing the story, you kind of feel a lot more investment in what's going to happen yeah. in this conflict. And we're hoping that that will be tense and exciting for people. And that's something we think we can do well. And I'll I suspect way. you'll be able to craft some very interesting narrative beats for the player in the moment-to-moment -moment behaviors Ooh, that they beats. undertake in this constrained and compelling space. Oh my god. <laughs> Maybe you should write the blurb for us. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> no, I think you will. No, okay. No, okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, maybe we should ask if you see if anyone has any questions or comments or yeah, we, whatever. We may be abutting the limits of our time. Yeah. But, um, but and we also don't want to keep talking because until I can we do get that. shouted off, if there are any questions. Yeah. Or oh, I, I think I, I'm being signaled that we're finished. Okay. <laughs> and he also has food. I kind of want food. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Aria. Thank you. Always a pleasure talking yeah. to you. Thanks, Lee. <laughs>